Well, I finally did it. This has been a book that's been on my list for quite some time. It's considered a classic in jazz literature, and it's Charles Mingus's autobiography entitled Beneath the Underdog. I had a former professor kind of give me a warning about this book, and he said, yeah, in it, there's a lot of things about Mingus. He's talking about the things that he does with women, or has done with women. And there is certainly a lot of that. So when he told me I was a little bit hesitant to read this, simply because I don't really care what goes on in these people's personal lives, but it is Charles Mingus, and it is a classic in jazz literature, so I kind of wanted to read it just to say that I did, to be quite honest. Now, uh, Charles Mingus, for those of you who don't know, one of the giants in jazz lore, uh, one of the most creative artists in jazz history, and certainly one of the most interesting characters in jazz history. He had a very interesting life, Plus, uh, there is another book called Myself When I Am Real, which I believe is just a biography of Mingus, but this is an autobiography. So if there is a biographical book, I'd much prefer to read an autobiography so I can hear it from that person's perspective. Now, depending on what edition you have, I don't know what edition this is. I picked it up for like a couple of dollars at a used bookstore long ago. It's been collecting dust on my shelf for quite some time, and so I finally got around to reading it. But this particular edition, the writing is actually quite small. Okay, very, very, very small. Okay. Now hopefully there wasn't anything too graphic on here, because when I say that there is a lot in here about what he does with women, and certainly what my former professor was referring to, there is a lot of stuff in here about what he does with women. In fact, uh, the whole middle of the book is pretty much like that. Very, very graphic descriptions of what he did with them very graphic depictions of his sexual encounters, and a lot of info in here about his life as a pimp. Now just to give you some idea, I wrote some page numbers in here so that I could share a little bit from you. And from page 92 to page 216 is basically all his life as a pimp entirely. And so that's why there's a huge gap there, because simply, well, I can't just sit and read the whole entire book here. Uh, but that was literally that many pages. That's 124 pages where there's just really nothing to share, nor could I share even if I wanted to because it's so graphic. In fact, it's almost pornographic, if I'm being honest. Now, in addition to his life as a pimp, it talks about his childhood, which is actually quite fascinating, and talks about how he was taught by an Asian family how to stand up to bullies using some kind of martial arts that they knew, and it chronicles that part of his life all the way up through his life in Bellevue Mental Hospital, and his release. There are a real lot of fascinating interactions that he had with Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, Billie Holiday, and a real lot with Fats Navarro, and actually there's a very lengthy and spiritual conversation that's documented in this book right at the end, and that's how the book ends. Don't worry, I'm not giving away any spoilers here. And obviously if Mingus wrote the book, he intended for this book to be this way, but I just don't find it that interesting. On the one hand, as I'm speaking over a large squawking bird outside my window. Um, on the one hand, it's cool because it's genuine, but I don't like it uh, because I really wanted to hear more about his musical approach. Talks a lot about how Art Tatum helped him develop his uh, musicianship and uh, his time with Art Tatum too. But I shouldn't say a lot, it's actually not that much. But, hey bird. All right, so, First passage to read. There is some interesting language in here. For example, the beginning of chapter 12. Charles had been studying with Red Calendar for about a year when one Saturday afternoon he was in his room at home working out an arrangement of I'll Never Smile Again for the Union Band and the phone rang in the key of F flat. So there's some interesting language in here for sure. A lot of uh, sort of slang that was common with uh, jazz musicians at the time. Uh, so you can get down with that and learn a little bit more about that if you want. Now here's another thing. Uh, I'm going to try to edit this as much as I can, but page 77 is where it really starts to uh, kick up a notch. This is a encounter he had with a woman in a lake near a beach. The water won't help, baby. You can't get away. You called it anyway, so how does it feel? No, 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 you're no bitch. You're an angel who's never been effed or had her blank, kissed, or slapped. Hold still, you slippery witch. You almost made me hurt you. I've got you, damn you. If you can't swim, you better learn now, mama. From here on out, it gets deeper, and I sure can outflow you. Yeah. I have to admit, 
when I laughed really hard when he said slippery witch because I just wasn't expecting that him to say that. It was just kind of a slippery witch. Slippery witch. That's really strange. But anyway, it's that it's that kind of language though, uh the that is not uh, funny. But slippery witch I thought was a little bit funny. Ninety-two. So this page actually talks about. There's a huge chapter in here where he's having a conversation with his dad, and he talks to his dad about his father's attempted suicide. Dad, do you remember the time I came home and heard your car motor running in the garage? I almost fainted from the carbon monoxide when I opened the door. I saw that red tube in your hand that you snatched from the exhaust when you stumbled out of the car. You said, "Go in the house. The door's open. I'll be in in a minute, son." I was afraid to tell you that I knew what you were doing, but I know God sent me to tell you to wait your turn. That was a bad day, son, but I'm glad you showed up. So yeah, it's a very dark, there's a lot of dark moments in this book. It's extremely dark. Now, skipping forward, 124 pages, to page 216. Why? Why? It's not for me anymore. I don't want you to. Well, then, for your music. He's having an argument with one of his uh, girlfriends. Well then, for your music, you'd die punching a clock if it kept you away from that. I don't think so anymore. I'll have more to say musically, living with the underdogs, beneath the underdogs. More to write about. Why didn't you get a job then when Barbara and her parents wanted you to? Barbara was one of his early love interests. It was too early to interrupt my studies. I'd never have made up that time. You can't stop playing... You, you can't stop music any time, Mingus. I could play cello concertos once, now I can barely play in tune. Lee Marie, you only practiced because your parents made you and you stopped first, chance you got, just like my sisters. If all the money you spent on them was spent on a good teacher for me, I'd have made it when I was five years old. I was no genius, Mingus. You didn't try to be. Maybe I am. No one's going to stop me anymore. I've acquired technique now. My mind can think through practice with the same and better results as if I'd worked through hours and hours. Now I can work on anything, in a post office or anywhere, and be practicing in my head. The only thing that would suffer would be stamina and toughening my calluses. So that's a very important passage, because what he's saying there is he's actually practiced enough he could hear the music in his head, and therefore he can actually also hear a piece of music and interpret what it is without picking up his bass. Now that is a mark of a professional musician. That's why I always talk about why learning songs from the sheet is a very dangerous practice. It's too easy for it to become a crutch, and you're not developing those internal skills. Why is it that Beethoven was able to compose music when he was deaf? It's because it was all in here. It wasn't out here. Okay, So that's a very important passage in the book, that if that doesn't wake you up to trying to learn your ear, nothing will. And one final passage from this book. Now, obviously, we know that jazz is an African-American tradition, and it's a type of music that celebrates diversity. And Louis Armstrong, for example, was one of its uh, champions in terms of diversity, the fact that anybody can play it. And um, this was at a time, uh, I'm not sure when this particular interview took place, but this is sort of a long passage where a British journalist comes up to Mingus for an interview. Mingus didn't really want to give an interview, but he kind of got drawn into answering a whole bunch of questions. Anyway, what about British jazz? Have we got the feeling? Mingus replied, if you're talking about technique, musicianship, I guess the British can be as good as anybody else. But what do they need to play jazz for? It's the American Negro's tradition. It's his music. White people don't have a right to play it. It's colored folk music. When I was learning bass with Ryan Shagan, he was teaching me to play classical music. He said I was close, but I'd never really get it. So I took Paul Robeson and Marion Anderson records to my next lesson and asked him if he thought that those artists had got it. He said they were Negroes trying to sing music that was foreign to them. Solid. No white society has its own traditions. Let them leave ours to us. You had your Shakespeare and Marx and Freud and Einstein and Jesus Christ and Guy Lombardo, but we came up with jazz. Don't forget it. And all the pop music in the world today is from that primary cause. British cats listen to our records and copy them, why don't they develop something of their own? White cats take our music and make more money out of it than we ever did or we do now. Which is which was true at that time for sure. My friend Max Roach has been voted best drummer in many polls, but he's offered less than half of what Buddy Rich gets to play the same places. What kind of shit is that? The commercial people are so busy selling what's hot commercially 
They're choking to death the goose that's laid all them golden eggs. They killed Lester and Bird and Fats Navarro, and they'll kill more, probably me. I'll never make money, and I'll always suffer, because I shoot off my mouth about agents and crooks, and that's all I feel like saying tonight. So that's a lot to digest from Mr. Charles Mingus. Uh, Max Roach didn't play in a big band, though. Uh, Buddy Rich was commercially successful uh, because he was playing a music that was more commercially, commercially viable, and so he was able to demand more money for it. Um, so that's not really a fair statement. Uh, so I wrote an article maybe two years ago in Jazz Guitar Today, and it's called, Is Playing Jazz Cultural Appropriation? Or what would have been a more accurate title is, When People Who Are Not African American Play Jazz, Is That Cultural Appropriation? And my argument was certainly no. Um, this is a, it's a respect thing, you know. Uh, sure, there is systemic racism that has in the past, certainly, uh, paid white musicians more for doing the same thing that black musicians are doing. That is certainly the case. However, the whole tradition of jazz, even though it's rooted in uh, African-American slavery, has evolved to include people of all walks of life. Uh, New Orleans, the cradle of jazz. You had Creole people who was, it was a com Creole people were any combination of uh, African, French, and Spanish people, or European white, but mostly those other, the first three that I mentioned. Uh, but then you did have white musicians playing, and um, you know, there were white musicians who were accepted by African Americans back, way back when too. Louis Armstrong, one time when he returned to New Orleans, uh, he had an integrated band racially, and he was actually told that he could not play this big festival in New Orleans unless he got rid of the white musicians that were in his band. And he was so hurt and offended by this that he requested to never ever come back, or he vowed never to come back to New Orleans and he requested to not be buried there. That's why even though Louis Armstrong is not only one of the most monumental musicians in music history and also one of the most celebrated sons of New Orleans, that's why he is buried in Flushing, New York, not New Orleans, because that was his request based on that incident. So yeah, in a time when um, there was a whole lot more racial tension, I know it seems like there's more now, but it's nothing like it was in the 50s and 60s because, you know, uh, in the 50s, black people didn't even have the right to vote yet. Um, it just seems like there's a lot more now because we can access it via the internet. There's a whole lot more out there going on uh, than we realize. However, stuff like this was going on in the 50s too and been before, you know. So yeah, we have made a lot of advances culturally, but we still have a long way to go. But let's not act like oppression is something new, because it certainly is not. Uh, having said that, I can sympathize with Mingus here because the times that he was living in and uh, the time that his uh, statements were made, uh, he died in 79, so I'm not sure when this particular uh, interview took place with this British journalist. Uh, however, I can certainly sympathize with what he's saying and um, I'm sure it's, it's a lot different looking uh, on the inside, you know. In other words, if you're an African-American in the 50s and 60s, and it, certainly an African-American now, it's, a, you know, it's hard for somebody like me to do that. So I sympathize with him on that. Um, but jazz, and just like any form of music, uh, it belongs to everybody. Uh, it doesn't belong to any one race, one group of people, one religious people. Um, it's music is for everybody. So... Um, Overall consensus about this book, if you're a diehard jazz fan and study and a student of jazz like me, um, sure, pick it up. But I don't recommend it for the casual jazz fan at all because you won't learn a whole lot about him other than, uh, well, he was quite the character and had a lot of uh, issues <laughs> and a lot of um, issues with women and women seem to kind of control his life for the most part. And so... Yeah, I don't know what I would grade this. A C plus? C plus? It's average. Uh, and maybe, maybe someday I will read the biography myself when I am real. But I think I've had my fill of Mingus for a while. And for at least a time, <laughs> and at least for the time being, I will stick to just listening to his records because he was certainly a brilliant musician, even though his character was quite flawed. But hey, nobody's perfect. 
And um, that's this book review. So I will see you soon. Bye-bye.